Yeah, welcome, Sam and uh, Kenny. Uh, we are here uh, today uh, in the aftermath of the Kohohui Collective Housing Symposium that we held here in uh, Victoria University of Wellington on the 22nd of June. And our speakers for that event were Kenny Ash and Sam Brown from the UK. So Kenny uh, founded Ash Sakula Architects with Robert Sakula in 1994. And the practice has been a supreme winner in the 2016 Housing Design Award for Mailings, a Riverside neighbourhood in Newcastle upon Tyne. In 2017, its 475 home Wixed project was overall winner in the new London Architecture Awards. They're currently designing 700 homes using the concept of deliberate communities along the river in Luz for developers, human nature, and inventing post pandemic uses for two old department stores in the town of Bedford and city of Peterborough. Alongside its architectural work, Ash Sakula has pursued constructive propaganda through a series of projects captured in short films and websites. Collective custom build, adaptable neighborhoods, the Lightbox house, and the meanwhile London Caravanserai all champion people and their livelihoods against a backdrop of thoughtless land assembly for development and demolition of worthwhile structures. Wow. Sam is an ARB registered architect with wide range of UK housing uh, practice experience. He's also taught architecture at various levels of a number of schools of architecture in the UK and internationally, and carried out industry-based research projects for national bodies in his specialist field of community-led housing and self-built projects. He's also an accredited community-led housing advisor, working with enabling hubs in London and the West Midlands. At the Sheffield School of Architecture, Sam leads the Live Projects Program across both years of the MARC uh, Architecture course and the MA Architectural Design course. He also co-directs the collaborative practice route to MR qualification. Uh, and he is involved in the teaching of environment and technology. Um, welcome uh, and uh, particular welcome for uh, agreeing to do this uh, somewhat um, artificial uh, recreation of uh, that wonderful event that we had at Koho Hui. Um, so perhaps I could ask if uh, to start us off, you could take us through some of the uh, key points that you covered in your addresses. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us to present some work that we did some time ago, but which um, still we are finding has an impact in the UK. I'm really gratified to hear that um, you're picking up on it on the other side of the world. Um, the, the project was um, uh, something which uh, came about through some funding which was available, and I think that... Um, uh, Sam, you're going to talk a little bit more about that backdrop in a minute. Um, could we have the next? So we invented yeah, um, an, um, a website, an organisation called Collective Custom Build, because we were aware that there was a gap, really, in provision. ...themselves more through creating housing for themselves. Um, typically wouldn't have enough capital to do that, but if they could join together in say groups of like 30 families, then they could more than outbid um, typical developers because they were um, invested emotionally and um, with their sweat equity and with their cleverness to make the most of sites. So each site is different, each collective custom build group is different. And so this little cartoon was an attempt to show you know, um, 
a strange shaped site with a with a with a very successful community. Next. And um, we, we for, for through another project, Adaptable Neighbourhoods, we've been finding that there's an awful lot of um, uh, sites which are just not recognised as sites for homes, which should be um, recreated as a mixed community. They're left um, sort of just um, in half decayed um, states on the edge of all of our cities. And so, Collective custom build had we felt the uh, power to to look anew at city making. Next, and this um, this was a little film we made about a few structures which uh, were demolished by the um, uh, what's now called Homes England you should be championing the reuse of buildings for homes, but we're actually um, demolishing them. So it's a little a campaign to look again at our heritage. These were old um, buildings from our industrial um, past on, on canals. Next. I think we have to go quite quick. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, and then you get strange shaped sites which developers don't really want to touch, but which collective custom build groups could really make um, uh, work um, in a cheek by jowl nature. Next. And it all comes from really a deep belief that um, everybody has something to offer to um, design and to particularly, um, you know, the, the intimate creation of um, spaces between buildings and making a neighborhood. Next. And, you know, not to say that the, the um, a, a typical property um, a company uh, and house builder wouldn't have some very interesting skills, but their motives and their, um, you know, final um, end game is to create more value out of a site for shareholders or to put into other projects, whilst, um, so maybe housing as a market product, rather than thinking about how that place can get um, more and more um, successful for occupants. And, you know, what was interesting when, when um, Sam and I uh, started working together, it was a bit of a blind date because um, he was offered by Sheffield University as a researcher to come and work in our studio, which was pretty thrilling. But at the same time, we sat down and um, the, the topic was so complex and so sort of um, fuzzy in some way on the edges. Um, we, we talked a lot about how do we make it um, seem sort of part of the mainstream that groups might get together and plot ways to bring funding and sites together. Because at the moment, it's very much seen as a kind of fringe, um, a, a fringe on the fringe, really. So um, when we'd, when we'd uh, been campaigning for the money, one of the things that we um, said we wanted to do was to make sure that we had an impact um, that was um, much broader than uh, our, um, you know, architectural bubble, and that maybe the best way to do that was through a film. I'm not sure what's coming next, actually. Uh, I, it, the, the slide on my screen is the one about the sand pit and the home improvements. Yeah, exchange. no, no. So this was the sand pit, as called. It was where we went up and competed um, against other groups to get the funding, and we were successful. I think largely because we we thought about how we would bring some structure to this fuzzy, fringy topic. And I guess the interesting thing there from my point of view is this, this was about kind of designing what the research project should look at, you know, and, and the idea you pitched was kind of coming from everything you've been saying so far about, um, you know, there being this idea about people getting together and building their own homes in some way, but, but there's a context that that's trying to happen in that's quite challenging. And actually maybe our research projects and our bit of constructive propaganda could um, 
could help that happen more because you and I have both had some direct experience of, of that kind of thing. And we felt we felt the benefit. Um, but actually, you know, res the research project can legitimize it somehow in a, in a particular context. And um, I think the, the great idea that came out that Ash Sackler brought was this idea about using, using film and, and mixed media to get that message out there and engage, you know, make the research a very engaged bit of research. Um, so next one, about why they chose you, Kenny, why, why we went with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this is really um, about the fact that we're at a cusp where there's new digital tools that we can use to bring groups together and to find funding. Um, and maybe those are more um, open than they have been. Um, agencies are beginning to, government agencies are beginning to realize that they need to respond to this. And a level playing field isn't just something um, which can always be pushed off into the long grass. So we were, we were looking at the, the different agendas around um, housing um, in that context of how we could enable um, individuals with no previous knowledge to, to become um, agents in this game. And we also um, could see that the, the government was very keen on um, a quick fix or uh, at least a technological fix. And that how could we respond to that by using offsite manufacturing and local skills and bringing those together. So we have this little cartoon at the bottom which shows how the factory moves around from site to site and uh, pops out homes which don't all look the same. They might use the same tools to make, to put the frames together, but they don't have to be cookie cutter homes. Hmm. Yeah, I think, um, Kenny, you also, um, I remember that previous slide, if we can just go back a couple, maybe just quickly. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, the one back again, please. Um, the um, image that you had on the left, you spoke to a little bit, and uh, with the Id idea that uh, actually the way these things link up is complex, and it's a complex uh, uh, problem, uh, and uh, that uh, perhaps uh, the solution. Uh, maybe is uh, not uh, as straightforward uh, as uh, what uh, it would be desirable for it to be. I mean, I think there isn't a nice roadmap that you can pick yeah. up in a leaflet from yeah. the library. But yeah. at the same time, I think that, that that kind of idea of complexity is something which um, is quite paralyzing for groups. So I think what we were trying to do with this cartoon was to say, actually, there's loads of ways in, <laughs> but maybe the cartoon made it look like it's just a, um, a spider's web of complexity, I don't know. Um, the, the truth is when you start, from, it doesn't matter too much which corner you start from, perhaps you get offered a site, perhaps you find out about some fund, um, the point is, is to, to, to understand that um, there are links and, and you get from one calling card, you can get another one. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, Sam. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, it's not, not about whether it's complex or not. I think it's about whether someone kind of coming into that world understands that it's complex, you know, and in a way, if you know that it's supposed to be, or it, or it just is, and that's something you've got to navigate, that's less daunting than just feeling like you're getting it wrong all the time, which I think is what a lot of groups come up against is, you know, they get frustrated because they hit a hurdle and they don't yeah. necessarily see that there's another way around it, perhaps with a different partnership, a different way through this spider's map, spider's web of, uh, of connections and things. Yep. Um, so, so the project... The project was all about navigating in many ways, helping people to navigate. Is that a fair comment? That's why it seems from here. Mm. If we jump forward to that um, slide now with the film yeah. on it. So when we, was, when we started, um, we had the funding, we started working together. 
we were thinking about the fact that very often the only valid um, kind of um, uh, research is one that, that uh, looks at um, best practice projects. But the, um, what we came up against is that there, weren't, there wasn't really enough of um, you know, local projects always for people to explore. And so what we wanted to do is um, create um, a, a something where even if something wasn't built yet, the amount of energy that had gone into failing to build it perhaps, or you know, getting um, the culture in place was still worth talking about. Um, so I mean, we, we wanted people to kind of be able to immerse themselves in that culture through reading documents which otherwise were quite scattered. Um, and I think that, um, Sam, you're gonna talk about the way that we did that. Because um, at times it, it did seem to be um, slightly foolish in that, that it was far too big for two people in a part-time way to harness um, all of the answers. And then we started realizing well, why don't we just deal with the questions in some way that feels very open weave and allows people to explore with us. Um, yeah, that I think right? that's a good way to describe it, you know, because it is a lot and it. And as, as Candy's already said, you know, you can, it doesn't matter which, which corner of this world you start at, um, you kind of need to know where to go next. And, and, and we thought, you know, there's a load of questions we have as the researchers, you know, on paper, the researchers doing the project, um, why don't we just structure, you know, the findings in the same way that, that our questioning kind of ran. Um, this, the, the image on the screen is, a, is one of our working drawings, basically we were trying to work out how, how then that should all come together in some way. How would you help someone navigate this kind of diverse and complex array of information that does exist? Um, and it kind of all, all hinged on, on this word of, of a, called a peel back that we kind of inherited from the, the research proposal from the sand pit that was thrown in there at some point by someone. And then, you know, we then had to work out well, what, that, what that meant, you know, and, and to us that, that kind of meant, you know, a, a film that would play, film being one of the most engaging ways to kind of digest information, you know, and, and producing a film forces you to construct some kind of coherent narrative. But then at points that film would, would literally peel back. It would allow you to, to kind of jump off the narrative and dive into the research detail that we'd collated and brought together. And so the, the, the kind of ribbon at the bottom of this drawing would be where those peel backs would appear and you could kind of click on them as the film was playing and it would pause the film and take you off into this, this kind of more, more kind of researchy, more, more, more kind of literate world. Um, and then the other component on the right was actually a kind of shopping list where if you liked the sound of any of those things that the film had, had peeled back and shown you, you could start to, to build up a kind of shopping cart of, of useful stuff for your project. And, you know, although the narrative was, was a singular narrative, different people will be bringing their own questions to that narrative when watching the film and therefore able to take away the bits relevant to them. That, that was the kind of design intent. And then you know, we, we ended up working with a, a web designer to help us implement that. And this drawing was a bit about trying to convey that, that um, idea for a tool, you know, a, a navigational tool um, to, to those web designers to help them help, them help us build it. Um, I think what we did next, Kenny, was we showed the film. And it's a yeah. question for you, Mark. Do you, do you want us to show the film on I the I think it'll be or? wonderful. In the UK, our housing needs are not being met. It's a big political issue. We are not building enough homes. Over the last 20 years, the UK has increasingly come to depend on a small number of large volume house builders, a well-structured industry. When the market is booming, it delivers housing in large chunks. Why? Now, more people are getting together and thinking about what they actually need rather than what the house builders want to give them focusing on the livability of a home instead of the short-term appeal of a market product. Because building your own place doesn't have to be something only the well-off can consider. 
the National Planning Policy Framework places a duty on local authorities to measure and provide for the demand of those that wish to build their own homes. A pilot custom-built revolving loan fund via the government's Homes and Communities Agency provides access to short-term development finance for multi-unit custom-built schemes. Innovation is sweeping across the housing sector with collective custom-build as a central strand. Groups with shared needs and interests can coalesce through crowd and cloud technology, unlocking powerful new ways to channel energy and finance projects that have never existed before. Off-site manufacture of houses gives a greater consistency in build quality and performance and quicker build times, further reducing risk for self-builders and their partners, pump priming a local knowledge base of skills and post-industrial development. In other countries, it is quite usual to be more involved in the design and build of your own home and it is becoming more so here. The number of self-built homes in the UK already matches the output of any of our biggest house builders. With collective custom build, individual self-builders combine to take advantage of the opportunities that come from working together. Homes built collectively benefit from economies of scale and shared access to supply chains and build future neighbourhoods based on mutual support and the sharing of risk. Such interconnected neighbourhoods deliver benefits in health, education and social cohesion. Collective custom build groups are enabled by partnership between local authorities, registered providers, developers, house builders or other third sector organisations and the local support so needed to secure planning permissions. With sales guaranteed up front, collective custom build can act as a financial catalyst, a pre-financed starter phase for more traditional housing projects, a productive seedbed. Collective custom build can unlock home building opportunities on challenging sites, the kind of sites only too familiar to many local authorities and their developer partners. Self-builders are free to think more imaginatively about, say, a large edge-of-town greenfield site, typically anonymous and badly connected, looking for an identity and sense of place. A collective custom build development reaches out to surrounding neighbours and builds a new, distinct community harnessing the potential of shared space. On smaller dispersed sites such as urban brownfield land or the industrial fringes of rural areas, collective custom builders enjoy the opportunity to build dense developments of unconventionally shaped homes cheek by jowl with existing buildings and infrastructure, creating an intriguing new quarter in the city. Or through re-inhabiting an existing building, there are custom builders searching for a genuine historical connection and sense of place, and the cracking of an otherwise doomed piece of heritage. More and more people are getting together and making things happen on the ground, and central government seems to be listening. Collective custom build, an idea whose time has come. So there, what you see now on the slide is a kind of, you know, the, the, the finished version of that drawing. So, you know, that's the sketch, that's the, that's the thing. But I, I guess what we can show people on the recording now is, you know, the film's playing, there's obviously a narrative in the audio, um, and then uh, these are the peelbacks. So they'll be coming through. In fact, if I skip ahead, you can see them kind of sliding in in different chapters, and then at the side here, this is your, these are the um, the kind of direct links to the the information. Um, so you know, for example, if you wanted a kind of summary of the around the world chapter, which is I think what we're on at the minute, you can add that to your basket, and then up here you can get your list, and it will email it to you at the end, and it's got it there. Look, so all still working, which blows my mind. <laughs> um, yeah, so putting together that that narrative and that film did require quite a lot of us kind of mapping and trying to construct the narrative and, you know, very, very kind of manual analog way to do that. Um, this was a wall in the, in the studio at Ashtakula at one point, I was trying to make sense of all that information. Um, and then, you know, thinking about what that would, would kind of look like um, uh, and uh, how it might display on different devices. Um, so kind of trying, trying to make this a kind of brand as much as anything, you know, something that people might see that kind of logo and think, um, oh, okay, that that's a kind of source of information on this on this subject. Um, I should probably at this point mention the, the you know the people that put put the money in basically. So you know the project was funded by the Arts and Humanities mm -hmm. Research Council in the UK, um, and uh, it was kind of badged you know home improvements generally, and that involved some other projects as well as ours. Um, and Design for Homes were another partner who are a social enterprise based in London that try and lobby from the inside for better practices in the house building industry. Um, and so they, they kind of um, helped us with exposure for this. So we, we kind of went out and about with this tool. Um, we had a parliamentary launch in the UK parliament here 
um, and got some attention uh, in kind of government circles as well. Um, and that was mainly kind of designed for homes is kind of lobbying work that helped with that. Um, so this is kind of, you know, us getting out and about and some of that, some of that kind of research and practice. Because um, once we built the tool, we kind of wanted to use it um, and, you know, use it as, as Kenny kind of nicely puts as a bit of constructive um, uh, propaganda. And, and I, I think of this as kind of advocacy work, being out there as an advocate for this way of doing things. Um, so top left is um, some of Ash Sackler's clients at that point, thinking about how these ideas might actually play out on a piece of land that they were looking at for something. Um, and then bottom right is, is kind of me on the road shows talking to local authorities about this kind of work and how they might be able to enable this. Um, so these are, are councils here, are local councils that set planning policy locally about how, you know, how these kind of things might, might be um, good as part of a kind of local housing mix and what, what kind of policy might work in terms of making them happen. Um, and then, you know, research projects are often time limited in terms of their funding. So, um, you know, Kenny and I were also both working uh, on other projects at the time in, in the self-build world. And, and this, one, one of the things that was kind of happening just as the, the research money was kind of drawing to an end was a, a competition called um, Self-Build on a Shoestring, run by the National Custom and Self-Build Association that we, we both entered. Um, and we, you know, Kenny at her offices kind of convened a, a get together of everyone that was shortlisted but kind of didn't win. Um, and to try to deconstruct, uh, you, you know, what, what was great about our different ideas and, and what perhaps where they could go, where they could develop. And at that, we kind of also shared, shared this research we've been up to. Um, and the, the kind of feeling was that it would be really great to go and see some of this stuff, um, you know, in practice um, and get out and about and, and, and bring some of our um, kind of less convinced colleagues with us, you know, to continue this kind of advocacy work um, and some of the clients we were working with as well. Um, so we decided to go to Berlin, which is where, you know, we think of it as the kind of home of custom build at the minute because um, of this phenomenon called the Baal Group and the Building Group, where, where people get together and invest their own money in building um, effectively apartment blocks for themselves. Um, and um, yeah, so out we went, took, taking people with us. Um, and we met up with Michael Lafond, who's been a previous keynote speaker at um, Coho Hui, as I understand it. Um, uh, and you know, he, this is him taking us around a tour of um, one, of, one of the projects he's worked on at the Spreefeld, um, right on the banks of the River Spree. Um, you know, he's just pointing out here that in Germany, the lenders, the banks, you know, finance is a key component in this, in this kind of network of that, that you have to explore. Um, the banks don't see this as that risky. You know, they see this as actually good business because the people, you know, getting together to build their own homes are really invested in the success of that. When someone who's doing that speculatively, you know, a, a, a conventional developer building speculatively, um, will walk away if that risk gets too great. They'll cut their losses at some point. Um, uh, and the banks in Germany don't really see it that way. They kind of see that as a bigger risk than, than funding people directly building for themselves. Um, uh, yeah, kind of building with a loose fit, I think, seemed to be a theme in the, in the building groups in Berlin as well. I don't know if you'd, you'd agree with that, Kenny. Um, but, you know, high ceilings. Um, and uh, kind of a raw finish that allows life to then, you know, collect around that, um, you know, rather than high-end, very particular finishes that someone, you know, designs to the nth degree and then tries to sell because it looks great in the marketing interior. Um, you know, it's interesting for me, you know, it's what, what do people build when they actually build what they want rather than take what they're given. Um, always quite interesting. Um, we also kind of had a great opportunity on that visit to kind of look into the kind of the kind of radical housing history in Berlin and talking to a lot of the people who are now getting together in a, in a very organized way and building, ha having had roots in this kind of squatting movement um, and in, in kind of occupying older buildings and adapting them and, and having to kind of establish and prototype the, the social structures within, within which that can all happen. Um, and, you know, looking at the kind of spaces that people build in, so lots of shared space. This is a, an event space in a project called R50. Um, you know, again, quite a raw finish and just very, very flexible. Um, good daylighting, good relationship to the street. Um, you know, you can, you can hang, hang flags up if you need to, but you could also strip that back and have it as a more somber setting if that was what was needed. You know, very, very um, kind of intelligent spaces that get, get designed into these um, collective custom build projects. Um, Big Yard, an another project that we really like to look over when we went. Um, uh, I'll rattle through that. 
And uh, this is actually a video, but um, Ilse Wolf, uh, an architect who works with a lot of these collective custom build projects in Berlin um, that we met and, and talking, talking about the things that um, make it worth it. Who are, uh, who are informed, who are, who, if there are big problems, for example, when this moment when the bank said no, you know, this is a hard thing for them. And nobody is hysteric. Everybody is, uh, everybody is uh, positive and saying, let's think what we can do, what we could do. There's no panic. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy about uh, having the experience to see people in a horrible situation and yeah. keeping their nerves. That is happy. Self-building, as a phrase, is kind of you know applies to this collective custom build world and. Um, you know, in the UK, it kind of is viewed as this really, it's, it's something between you know, anything between, you know, what the state provides and what the market, you know, speculative market provides. And, you know, both of those other models are really, you know, about um, kind of quite, quite generic and repetitive um, forms because they either need to house as many people as possible in, the, in a welfare sense, or they need to get as many kind of assets on the land to sell as possible to increase the profit margins. And, you know, self-build can kind of be the thing in the middle, the, the thing that, that addresses the needs not met by um, by those two models. I'm um, going to rattle through a few kind of other other examples of projects from the UK, um, just to kind of give a bit of a flavour. So this is Walters Way, which is in Lewisham, South London, um, and uh, this this was a, a local authority enabled project in the in the early 80s um, here. Um, Lewisham had a housing crisis in the 80s. Uh, you know, housing crises are not new, as far as I can tell. Um, and uh, at this point in time, the local authority was just a lot more empowered. We, we have a, a culture of austerity here in Britain at the minute where the state has been shrinking for 30, 40 years. Um, that's the, that's the prevent, uh, kind of prevalent political agenda, let the state do less. Um, but at this time, it had, had more power and resources than now. And so part, part of the reason it was kind of addressing well, part of the tactics it was using to address a housing crisis was to buy up land to develop, you know, um, and it bought land off plan without really seeing it. And this 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 land is kind of steep and wooded. And so kind of conventional building was going to be very expensive and not viable. Um, and uh, this scheme is actually built out with a technique called the Siegel method, which was developed by um, a, an architect called Walter Siegel, um, which you may be familiar with. Um, basically a, a timber frame self-build system um, you could you can erect it with very very little starting sc uh, skill so if you could the, the story goes if you could cut a straight line and uh, drill a hole you could build a house um, all the wet trades are kind of eliminated from the system um, and it's kind of because it's kind of lightweight it can be built around existing trees um, and so so the you know the site was provided by the local authority the, the participants in the scheme were selected um, by, by ballot from a, from a waiting list, a social housing waiting list. Um, so you had to be in housing need. You didn't have to be already in council housing. You could be in, in a kind of precarious um, situation in the private sector. That's what made you eligible. Um, you committed a certain number of uh, kind of hours to kind of help build the houses. Um, and uh, at the end of it, you, you bought the house. So the local authority was funding the materials and the professional services, but you bought the house at the end with a shared mortgage, shared ownership mortgage. Um, and the other partner in that was the council. So, you know, really enabled by a, by a council. Produce a wonderful place to live because, of course, you can complete, um, you, can, you can retain all the existing trees um, because of the construction method. And they're all detached houses. So that's another kind of enabling thing here. Each family worked on their own house, um, but uh, did informally, you know, informally people helped each other to kind of raise the frames and all of that kind of thing. Um, yeah, lovely place to live, as you can see on the right. Um, here's a bit of the frame raising. There's some, some of the drawings on the right about, you know, the way, you know, the way that timber system goes together. Um, and yeah, lovely place to live, as I say, but, the problem with this is because it's become so desirable um, and there's been no protection of that initial kind of public investment for the long term, uh, these homes are now in the open market and uh, changing hands for close to a million pounds. So now not affordable, now not kind of in the interests of um, the community now. Um, but, you know, as I say, public land, public resources. Um, How did it transition from uh, the shared ownership uh, mortgage model so presumably the um, local authority retained a share in the ownership of these houses is mm. that what happened 
that is I, here I mean, it's quite hard to get into the detail of it but in in shared ownership mortgages in the uk there's a kind of legal um bit of frame you know le- legal framework around them that basically entitles or did at this time uh, entitles the the occupant to staircase that ownership so to, to gradually increase their ownership over time so they would they would buy an initial stake um nowadays you pay rent on the rest um but that rent level was set to allow you to save to then buy further chunks of that house and so you could effectively staircase into full ownership which is what's happened um, All right okay thanks for that yeah yeah it's, i don't know if that's i don't know if you have equivalent kind of mortgage products no i don't think thing. so uh they're, they're kind of they're, they're double-edged in my view um because in london at the minute shared ownership is a bit of a trap because you can basically end up having to pay so much rent because the rent is set as a percentage of the value of the house. If the house is really valuable, that rent level will basically not allow you ever to save for the rest. <laughs> um, so, you know, quite tricky. But at the same time, they can reduce that initial um, purchase point. So if you, if, you, if you are a kind of a more benevolent organisation, such as a community-led housing organisation, you can, you can set those parameters to achieve the objective which is getting people into affordable home ownership in some cases um yeah you're in if you're in control of that rent level and you don't set it as a percentage of market value then you've got a bit more a bit more um, control so it could be good it could be bad depends who's in charge like most things um so uh the next slide uh is actually then so you know this this built in the early 80s um there are children of the those families who've grown up there love it they know their parents have this opportunity, um, but they don't have that opportunity. Um, and they recognise that part of the reason they don't is because the, the kind of long term community value of these places is not necessarily enshrined in, in any kind of governance structure or, or legal uh, sense. So they've kind of formed their own group. They formed the Community Land Trust, um, which is another type of community and housing organisation uh, emerging here. It has its origins in the civil rights movement in the US, um, but has taken root all over the globe. Um, basically means land is held in trust for the community um, and that's a, we have a particular legal form that's based around a cooperative structure here in the UK um, that allows them to do that. Uh, the, the, the group that those kids have formed, I say kids, they're all my age, <laughs> but they've grown up there, um, is called the, the Rural Urban Synthesis Society. So they're, they're picking up on, a, on an ideology that's actually there's some great things about living in a city and there's some great things about living in a rural setting and you know, could you develop a project in London that, that enabled the kind of best of both? Um, and they're, they're kind of resisting that, that, um, that, that commercial kind of pressure um, to, to commodify everything and trying to place the, the land that they get or, and the homes they build in this trust. Um, but they're having to kind of organise and, and fight through a system that isn't designed for, you know, lay people. It's designed for professionals and it, it's a very professionalised system. Um, and the difference, the key difference between what they're having to do, um, two thing, two key things really, the difference between what they're having to do and what their parents had to do was that um, density is a huge thing now in London. You can, can't really get away with building affordable, detached, single family, two storey homes. You've got to build flats, essentially. So bottom right is the kind of an early image of what they're trying to construct. Um, and uh, the other is that the kind of... Um, yeah, the, the, just just that professionalised industry. So, you know, the money involved and the fact that the local authority isn't as well resourced anymore and can't really enable the project, um, you know, they're having to fundraise in a way that their parents never did. Um, another project, this is uh, called New Ground. Uh, it's in Barnet, which is in North London. And this has been delivered by uh, a group called the Older Women's uh, Co-Housing Group, OUCH. Um, and this has got a different kind of founding idea in that it's, um, it's about mutual support in old age. Um, so this is a, a group of women uh, who know each other through various networks and decided that actually if we could all live together in our old age, that would be much better than ending up in a care home, which is the prospect for most people, unfortunately, uh, mm. in the UK. Um, and uh, if they built a per, you know, purpose-built scheme that enabled their ideology, they could build into that um, uh, facilities for nursing staff to come and stay with them rather than them having to go to nursing staff um, and yeah. the, the kind of theme here is that they think that might reduce the burden on the local authority in terms of the social care budget long term um, uh, they had to so they, they delivered this in partnership with the housing association um, 
uh, they had kind of two housing associations they worked with, one, one that was a development partner. So the, the housing association actually put up the development finance, built the project out, and then they, they, they bought their flats at the end. And then another housing association helps them to place women into this scheme who are not as well off, you know, not well enough, well off enough to buy a property, um, but uh, can, can rent one instead. So there's some, there some um, social housing in here as well. Um, still took them a long time. So this, these are educated, informed, well-organized, experienced individuals. Um, and in the UK, they're still fighting that, that kind of overly professionalized and commodified system that I talked about. And it still took them 15 years to realize this, this project. Um, but now it exists and it's a fantastic kind of beacon for persuading and, and um, illustrating why um, these kind of schemes are worth, worth doing. Absolutely. Yeah. I was involved in a, a relatively modest uh, scheme here, 15 uh, apartments, but it was older uh, a woman and uh, it, it started with research but the same objective support for independence by living together they could put off the need to uh, go into care yeah and it, I mean it's I mean so that project has been you know all over our kind of uh, our national radio services and you know it's had a lot of exposure and I think you know, my parents are starting to talk about that kind of thing. So it's it's kind of getting into, uh, you know, more into the, the awareness, the, the lexicon of our, our kind of general general population, mainly is because people are terrified of going into a care system. You yes. Know, had a look. <laughs> so yeah. so it's, a, it's a kind of, you know, uh, an alternative, I think. Um, the one on the screen at the minute is uh, LILAC in Leeds, which LILAC stands for Low Impact Living Affordable Community. So this is a slightly different kind of community housing structure, um, the Mutual Home Ownership Society. And, and what this is picking up on is that not everyone can afford to own a home, but we might be able to afford them if we club together. But that even if you do that, you don't want that, that group to be kind of selecting only people who have a kind of minimum level of input and um, you know, minimum level of finances available. So a Mutual Home Ownership Society, again, it's based on a, a cooperative legal structure, but... Um, you don't own a house, you own shares in the house owning company, if I can put it like that. Um, and and the, the rate at which you can accumulate those shares is pegged to your income. And the idea is that you never spend more than a third of your income accumulating shares. Um, it's kind of also picking up on the idea that people might want to leave the scheme at some point and take, take some kind of appreciation with them of, of, of those shares. So this does allow people to benefit through ownership um, in, a, in a kind of conventional way which is in the UK, we're really kind of addicted to that. Our wealth and our particularly our kind of pensions are all based on us owning property um, and that, that kind of taking the place of a decent um, you know, social system that will provide for us in old age. So you know, people were really, really concerned about this idea of, of owning something and, and it appreciating in value during their ownership. Um, and that would put them off joining, say, a straightforward cooperative um, or, or some kind of more publicly minded project that is um, where the ownership, the, the affordability is protected in perpetuity through some kind of deed or covenant, you know, that would restrict their ability to benefit financially from it long term. So the mutual home ownership has emerged in response to that, that kind of cultural specificity, that specificity uh, here in the UK, um, developed here in the UK, but I think now getting traction elsewhere. Um, uh, the, this project has a great kind of website <laughs> that explains exactly what a mutual home ownership does and why you would look at one. Um, the other point I really like about this is that um, it's actually built out of uh, prefabricated timber frames filled with straw bales um, because they really wanted to reduce their energy consumption um, and their kind of embodied carbon, kind of the impact of the project. Um, and it helped because the site, they managed to get hold of quite a difficult site. And if this is a bit of a theme in the UK where when groups do get hold of land, it's typically land that no one else is interested in, uh, has some feature that makes it quite undevelopable. This had a, um, I think it's a massive trunk sewer under it. Um, and that meant you couldn't really dig big foundations. And so the buildings needed to be lightweight. Um, and this kind of quite innovative system at the time um, called ModCell, kind of enabled those buildings to be quite lightweight. And also because it was an innovative construction system came with a grant that helped with some of the construction costs and remediated the site. So I think it was also a bit contaminated. Mm. Um, 
so that, you know again t- tying the, the community led nature of this enabled it to tie in some of those different aspects on Kenny's web of, of different motivating factors or different different starting corners um, and ultimately their, their ability to do that and their their kind of tenacity in doing that is what made the project happen when otherwise it wouldn't have happened sure um, uh, quickly through this one so this is another community land trust um, down in Bristol in the southwest of the UK it's called Fishbonds Road um, this was this is kind of the, the community land trust there has a really good relationship with its local authority and the local authority almost sees it as a as a kind of arm's length version of itself doing what it would do if only if it was allowed by our prevailing political culture and so it's it's kind of supported with um, access to sites and, and funding um, and so this is a project delivered on a council-owned site to start with um, transferred to the community land trust for one pound um, and this is uh, kind of super affordable so a lot of one bedroom apartments in here that are uh, are kind of released on a self-finish basis so people moving into them get to finish them off and there's a, a saving uh, because of that um, uh, so yeah just another example of uh, one of these kind of partnership approaches to getting this kind of thing done um, marmalade lane which is um this is getting in the press a lot here at the minute it's recently completed um otherwise known as k1 co-housing uh this is this is kind of often shown as an example of how a community-led approach um, can get development going when when other people don't want to invest. So this is a parcel of land that, uh, after the two thousand and eight financial crash, um, all all the development in this area of Cambridge just kind of stopped, and uh, the community group were the only ones really to come back and say, you know, we want to we want to do this again. They then had to work with the developer to to kind of raise the development finance, and they purchase their flats at the end from that developer but they've been in charge you know throughout the process um, and the spaces on the right are some of their shared spaces that they they kind of effectively commissioned in that development um, which wouldn't typically appear in a speculatively built housing development in the UK um, you know and, and I, what I like about this one is the different scale so you've got the kind of big party space at the top but you've also got the kind of smaller quieter um, separable space that's used as a nursery off to the side still close enough you know all the adults in the other room having fun but the kids can be kind of safe and under someone's guardianship in the other room um canny i i can't remember what we said about this slide but i remember it was something to do with something you'd said (laughs) use as many people as possible building uh community and housing so you talked about modern methods of construction that's right yeah. and modular off-site construction uh, might uh, uh, be more efficient, but it uses less people. That's right, yes. And that's picking up on a theme, you know, here in the, here in the UK, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, high-tech ways of building houses as being the future and, and that being kind of driven by, you know, economy, but also by um, performance, you know, so trying to pick up on the zero carbon agenda and the energy efficiency agenda. But, you know, it writes people out of the process, basically. And there's something about that self-build way of working together that builds something else at the same time that you're building the houses um, that is about a sustainable future. I think it's also about, like, just thinking about the whole life cycle of a home and the fact that it does need to be, um, there needs to be some tacit knowledge in the community in order to keep those places going. So if you never... um, if it just landed from the moon, you, you know, you're not going to feel terribly empowered to, to um, sort it out when it, when it leaks. Um, so it, it's, it's about keeping um, small building um, practices going throughout the country. Mm. And kind of that diagnosis knowledge, you know, something's wrong with the house. You know, who, how do you work it out <laughs> if you don't know how it's been put together or there isn't someone exactly. in the Exactly. Yeah be quite hard to work it out so yeah the robot doesn't care <laughs> um okay so i mean one of the other things we, we talked early in this uh, kind of presentation about about advocacy and you know we built a tool within a research project but actually then wanting to get out and use it for something and one of the kind of findings of that both the initial research but then also our subsequent you know going out about and talking to people was this need for for some kind of hub you know some some kind of local knowledge base and support network that um 
you know, if you don't get your answer from the film, <laughs> who would you go and ask and who, who would you go to to help kind of develop a project or, or even design a project, work out what a project is for you? You know, you might be interested, but but how do you turn that into something you can pursue? Um, and what has emerged since in the UK, and it's not 100% to do with what we did, but it, we were part of that conversation for sure, um, was, was this kind of emergence of regional community-led housing hubs. Um, and that's come about from the results of lobbying by a thing called the Community-Led Housing Alliance. Um, and the reason it's an alliance is one of the things that characterised um, the kind of sector, I hate using that word, but it, you know, in the UK was that it had single issue campaign groups. So you had the National Custom and Self-Build Association, who I mentioned before, who were thinking, you know, self-build is the answer, custom build is the answer. Um, we had the National Community Land Trust Network, who, who would be out there saying, you know, land trusts are the answer. We have the co-housing network, who said co-housing is the answer, with the self-help housing people. We, you know, we have a lot of these groups that campaign for their single issue thing and actually, you know, weren't getting attention of government because it was confusing uh, or if they were they were competing for the same resources you know, the same support and the same kind of small grant pots and, and things whereas you know the alliance was a bit of a movement amongst the people leading all those organizations at that time to to just start to try and speak with one voice to government you know and and, and therefore argue um, more cohesively for um, more opportunities for community-led approaches to house delivery um, and that's that's where this phrase, you know, community-led housing as a kind of catch-all term has kind of emerged for us in the UK. Um, this this slide is from the website of a, of a London hub, a community-led housing hub in London. Um, and, you know, it's just putting together quite, quite a, a rich um, array of kind of stories that will just help people believe that this is more possible and different kinds of support. So, you know... Um, what does shared living mean? You know, what are the lessons to be learned from, from Zurich, which is another trip that I put together, you know, we went to Berlin, but we also went to Zurich more recently. Um, you know, how does it fit into London's future? You know, these kind of things, they're, they're just having these conversations in quite a public way that in theory makes that more accessible, you know, makes people feel like it's more of a thing. Um, uh, yeah, as I said, the community-led housing is now a kind of umbrella term that we use in the UK. Um, you know, the, the, there are some interesting diagrams emerging about structure, about all of that. And it, you know, it doesn't really speak to kind of normal people, I don't think. But you know, for someone like me, it's always quite interesting. Um, and you know, making kind of training and resources available. So um, I can't remember if you if it was in my introduction, Mark, that you gave, but I'm, I'm also now an accredited community-led housing advisor. And that 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 service um, and that training is something that the hubs deliver here now. Um, so someone with a related background, so that's me as an architect, but people come into it from project management or from working in housing services and local authorities can, can go on a quite intensive um, training program um, and can then be held on a, on a national database and groups can go to that database for, to access and uh, you know, advice, basically. And, and I would then, you know, if I was appointed, I would be attached to a project and I'd guide it through the various stages of its gestation. Um, and that's alongside then some of the resources shown on this slide, which are about, you know, what is a financial appraisal? You know, what are the common ways people find sites or, you know, what is development finance and who might you get it from? And then there's one there on the end about, you know, an introduction to mutual home ownership societies, which we talked about earlier. Um, I think, Kenny, do you want to talk about this one? Because this is kind of about the hub and it and how it's how it's kind of talking to different authorities, I guess, and that the motivation is different in each case. I guess, from a local authority point of view. And I know this relates to some of the work you've been doing more recently with people like Lucian. Um, yes, I think that um, local authorities that who want to see less, um, you know, of the divide between the incoming gentrifiers and the um, existing population um, are looking for ways in which to um, create more housing, um, not in big chunks, but in small chunks. So we recently um, did a, um, it's just been, it's, it's, it's going into to, uh, their planning system now, and it's um, a, um, something called a supplementary planning guidance for, um, uh, people who want to develop small sites. So we were setting up 
um, parameters and um, really suggestions for a bit complicated, but um, because politically people don't want to build on gardens because those have trees in them and we've, you know, we need to increase our tree canopy in London by 30% or something. So it's, um, it's difficult to suggest that people just divide up the, their gardens, typically the end of their gardens is the richest bit of biodiversity. But at the same time, there is um, there's a lot of very low density housing in outer boroughs in London. So Lewisham is one of those, and it could be um, it could be really cool to to find spaces for, as Sam was saying, for people's children to stay locally in in the area they grew up, went to school, and um, that's what makes um, a place, isn't it? So we. we we, we tried to um, show ways in which um, you could create, say, courtyard houses um, so that all the windows were looking inwards and you, you could build much closer to other existing homes, stuff like that. I don't know if you, you had anything to say about the other boroughs. I mean, they're all, they've all got their own um, particular flavour, haven't they? Well, that, that's it. And I think what this is pulling out on the slide is, you know, there's, there's kind of some statements there and they're, they're picking up on, on the kind of things about community-led housing that appeal mm -hmm. to different local authorities. So, you know, Greenwich, for example, um, you know, that's, that's, they're kind of emphasising community land trusts. And this, this is a bit of a theme at the minute in that local authorities, because they're so restricted in their own resources and capacity, like the sound of an organisation that can basically put public assets into community trust for the long term um, you know and, and, and save them from having to sell them off to developers which is their only other way of de delivering housing often um, whereas you know Hackney there is, is kind of also emphasizing self-build they like you know they've got they've got a self-build challenge and I, I think this is about getting individual families as part of the program to to deliver to develop kind of difficult plots that are just too expensive for you know people to purchase and make a make a profit on um, but yeah, that was that one. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's pretty gloomy in London, isn't it? Like pr house prices are going up 9% this year and it's um, really just the march of more and more selling of, of, of um, you know, state land. That's the mm -hmm. story of the UK at the moment to private yeah. developers. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. And this is all kind of about trying to establish the counterculture to that, that, yeah. it, that, that has a hope of actually getting something done because, you know, it's always been there as an idea, but those, those barriers are quite significant, particularly in a city like London. Yeah. Um, uh, we have uh, similar problems here where uh, the price of housing has uh, gone up uh, ridiculously over the last uh, period of time uh, to the point where it's very difficult uh, for uh, first homeowners to uh, get on the uh, property ladder at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's, inter it's interesting to me that that is happening basically all over the world. And it, yeah. it's something about, you know, people, it's, it's kind of urbanisation of our society and that, that, that kind of, you know, scarcity that produces. You know, and land and also materials and cost of getting those things to that place you know that, that's got to be a theme but you know it's also about it's just just more and more of us and less and less stuff well, to go around uh, it's also about the financialization of housing mm -hmm. you know housing has become a preferred investment uh, when you get to the point where people uh, decide to buy 30 houses as an investment you know major uh, major groups uh, because uh, it's so lucrative. Uh, we don't have capital gains here, gains tax, so it's a kind of a little glitch that uh, is uh, uh, causing lots of problems. Right. I mean, we do, we do have capital gains tax and it doesn't stop it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's complex as, a, as all of it is that kind of... I think it's political, isn't it? Because housing speculation will carry on until... That it seemed to be damaging to the um, the city that's hosting it, and mm -hmm. I just read this morning um, in the Financial Times that that Berlin is voting in the autumn 
on a bill which would say that any um, uh, corporate uh, bodies that own more than 3,000 um, flats in Berlin will, can ha will have them kind of confiscated by, you know, at, at today's market rates by, by the Senate of Berlin. That's quite um, a high bar, 3,000 homes, mm. but it's, um, it's really interesting that that language is coming back in the idea of, of actually doing something about this speculation. Mm. For sure. Right. I mean, Germany is an interesting example because, because it's federalized. The, you know, the, the amount of kind of taxation that's kept locally and used locally is greater than, than in the UK for sure. And um, it means, you know, cities, you know, local jurisdictions like, like the Senate in Berlin can take that kind of action. You know, they, they can't have resources to basically. <laughs> um, and they feel the pain more, don't they? When, when yeah. there's speculation as well. And I'm conscious of time. Uh, yeah. And we're kind of at our, our last slide or two, which was our, we threw this in last minute at the end as an opportunity to have a little bit of a rant in a way, <laughs> because it was uh, a letter that's um, recently been written um, from our prime minister to a particular MP who's been a supporter of this sector, particularly of self-build housing, um, basically kind of tasking him with a review uh, you know, to, to undertake a review and establish a plan to scale up self and custom built housing. Um, uh, and he's written this letter, um, which, you know, on the face of it is great because it's, you know, there's, there's a tension on this subject or this method, this way of doing things at the highest level. And it's kind of being taken seriously uh, in terms of part of our solution to our housing crisis. But um, Canny kind of deconstructed it you know, I was being quite naive when I first read it, and I thought, oh, great, yeah, really good. And Kenny kind of deconstructed it um, uh, and offered a slightly more nuanced view, which is here on this slide. And I, I don't know whether you just want to rattle through that, Kenny, and just point out no. some of the things that <laughs> we'll, we can let people read it in their own time. I think it's just in the heat of the moment, really. <laughs> yeah. exactly. um, but I guess it's a use, I mean, I've kept it in today because it's kind of uh, interesting, you know you can get attention from the people you think might be able to support it but it's all there's always a uh, something else going on there and and you've got to be aware of what that is what strings are coming with the support um and this slide it's I think really helps. lovely isn't it Sam to hear that phrase more imaginative use of public land <laughs> yes. you think yes <laughs> and then and then there's everything else is tagged onto it including uh, you know sort of the armed forces and veterans and you know yeah. things like um what's this about yeah exactly exactly so it's, it's the kind of bit, it's the bin bag <laughs> and you um too uh both of you um uh perhaps we could uh finish uh the the presentation and uh just see you uh face to face before you go uh uh, as much as that's possible through uh, through Zoom. Uh, uh, thank you both uh, once again for your generosity, not only uh, presenting this really rich material uh, to our conference, but going through the process of uh, reorganising to do that again. So our, uh, our humble thanks and uh, it's our intention that this will become a record of the conference. It will go on the Housing Innovation Society's website and uh, potentially uh, uh, there, there might be a link associated with the university here uh, as well. Uh, so it, it's my hope that uh, um, we can carry on the conversation. And uh, I do hope that uh, we have uh, uh, some resources coming your way. Uh, I think uh, they've come the long way, uh, but uh, you'll find uh, there's some nice books and we have uh, quite a lot of digital information that we've compiled for you uh, on some USBs there. So we hope you find something interesting and valuable. Thank you again. Keep well. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, you yeah. too. <laughs> okay.
Thank you. Have a good day.